from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. My name is Grant Harris. I'm head of the European Reading Room. And uh, thank you all for coming to the Library of Congress today. We've got a really, really large crowd here. We should have had a larger room, but, but this is what we have. So <laughs> thanks for fitting in here. And, and we're, we're pleased to have Pat Grimstead to come back and, and talk to us again. She talked to us about three years ago, I think, uh, about uh, Nazi looted materials. Uh, Pat has, I've known Pat since 1985, maybe 1984 when she came and did some research in the European Reading Room. I know her really as having uh, compiled a whole shelf worth of books on archives in the former Soviet Union and then uh, materials that came out uh, or uh, after that in, in the former Soviet republics. But she's turned her attention um, to other, other materials now, um, plundered art and um, from the Nazi area, both, both the art and books. Uh, I should backtrack and say that uh, Dr. Grimstead is, is Senior Research Associate at the Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute, the Davis Center for Russian and Eurasian Studies, uh, and the International Institute for Social History in Amsterdam. She is the author of numerous books and articles on Russian and Soviet archives and the founder of Archaeobibliobase, and, and several of, of you have used that before. It's an online guide. Um, so, so today it's really more about displaced cultural treasures from the Second World War and restitution issues. And, and Pat has written uh, much about uh, Russia and Ukraine, but today's talk is in another area. It's, it's going to be about Minsk in Belarus and in the Czech Republic and in, uh, in the capital city of Prague. And in both cases, it's the national libraries uh, that are involved. There are uh, large clusters of uh, Nazi looted books that are uh, in or near those libraries. And so that's what we'll be talking about today. So. Pat, I'm just going to turn it over to you at this point. I, I should say um, Pat wanted me to show some of the materials that she's been, uh, been working on. This article from the International Journal of Cultural Property, I told a few of you about this earlier uh, uh, on this page, and the uh, uh, just an entire article devoted to that. So I'll pass it around for any of you who want to take a look at that. There's also uh, an article that she wrote about uh, Minsk, the road to Minsk for Western trophy books, twice plundered but not yet home from the war. Uh, so I'll pass that around as well. So And return from Russia. <laughs> and return from Russia. There, there are a number of works concerning Russia. So pass those around too. Okay. Now I'll turn this over to you, Pat. And this microphone that I'm holding uh, leads into the amplifier right there so people can really hear in the back of the room. And then the one in front of you is for the, the webcast. Can they get a few more chairs for our pa I I'll hate be to trying. see people yeah, standing. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll see what we can do, but that's, that's the way it is. Okay. Well, uh, thank you so much, Grant. And I am exceedingly grateful for my longtime friends and colleagues at the Library of Congress for inviting me to speak today. Um, and I'm so gratified that so many friends and colleagues gathered, some of, some of whom I've known for decades. Um, but particularly uh, those that most recently that I've known in connection with my work on displaced cultural treasures from the Second World War, what the Russians call displaced, uh, but I often call them twice seized. Uh, but I started with archives and then books, but today, let me just start with archives and, and, and most recently here at the library about art. But today I want to focus on the long neglected concentrations of Nazi looted books, particularly with examples in Minsk and Prague. 
but before getting to those two uh, hot spots, <laughs> as I call them today, uh, let me back up just a little bit to explain uh, a little of the background of how things got <laughs> to there. Last October, at a colloquium in Paris sponsored by the Turgenev Library Association, uh, where I was invited to speak, I recalled 100,000 books and archives for the Turgenev Russian Library in Paris that were plundered in the fall of 1940, shipped off to Germany by the Einsatzstabreichsleiter Rosenberg, or ERR, as I will refer to it later, a special task force initiated in Paris after the occupation by Adolf Hitler's ideological henchman, Reichsleiter uh, Alfred Rosenberg. Most of those books from the uh, BRT, or the Turgenev Library, uh, were, uh, went first to Berlin and then were evacuated to Ratibor, Silesia. Uh, where they ended the war, but of those, uh, six thousand between six and eight thousand, I've discovered, and they finally admitted in uh, the year two thousand, uh, are in the former Lenin Library in Moscow, which is now the Russian State Library. Another three to four thousand I have discovered were in Minsk. Um, I wrote a, and many of them in the meantime were just intentionally destroyed as unacceptable for Soviet libraries, and others were scattered throughout the Soviet Union because they didn't need all these Russian books from Paris uh, uh, in the Lenin Library because they were duplicates of things they had, and so they used them either for exchange or sending them uh, to libraries as far away as Sahalin, uh, an island above, uh, south of Japan. And, uh, but the, uh, the three to 4,000, as I say, are now in Minsk, divided between the National Library of Belarus and uh, the Presidential Library. Uh, last year, on the anniversary of the 70th anniversary of the Second World War, only 119 of those books have been returned to Paris. Of the, that is, of the 1,000 of the 100,000, have returned to Paris. And today, to be sure, the uh, Turgenev Library in Paris is a shadow of its pre-war glory as the most significant Russian library abroad. My monograph on the Odyssey of the Turgenev Library um, it tells that story. It was published in 2003 by the International Institute of Social History, or IISH, in Amsterdam, where I'm an honorary fellow. Um, and that's where my uh, archive, uh, Russian archive database is now housed. That institute, together with its Paris branch, suffered the largest non-government wartime loss of books and archives in the Netherlands, many of which today remain in the Russian Federation and in Belarus. Uh, the ERR actually took over the building of, my, of the, of the uh, Amsterdam Institute on the Kaisergracht. My French fr uh, friend and colleague, Martin Perlin, uh, author of the prize-winning study of French libraries during the war, estimates that 10 million books were seized from over 2,400 uh, individuals and 400 institutions in France uh, during wartime German occupation. A large percentage of those have never returned to their home libraries. While across the continent, we now estimate but, uh, approximately 12 million books were transported to the Soviet Union after the war as what they call compensation for the even more millions of books that were destroyed and plundered by the ERR and other German agencies in occupied Soviet lands. Uh, an effort today to try to locate and account for more of the books that were looted during the war and still displaced. I think there are four points that I would like to just emphasize in general. Uh, first, we need to determine the German agency responsible for the seizure, 
the deserts to the destination where the books were dispatched and their wartime migration to the extent that's possible. Uh, three, where the books ended the war. And four, what country found them after the war. Uh, because it's the last two elements that determine the success or failure of post-war restitution. Uh, today, I emphasize two of the largest concentrations of still displaced books looted in Europe by two rival Nazi agencies, one in Minsk and the second in Prague. But uh, let me back up just a, a few minutes and, and tell you a little bit about how they got there. Uh, the ERR that I mentioned at the outset only, occup only uh, operated in the German-occupied uh, lands throughout the European continent. But their rival was the Reich Security Main of uh, Office, R.S. Uh, whose looted library collections in Berlin by 1943 may well have exceeded those collected by the ERR. Those were books seized by both the SD, the Sicherheit Dienst, and the Gestapo. But first, let me just say a word about the ERR. I'm currently completing, uh, sponsored by the uh, claims con the Jewish Claims Conference, uh, an updated and greatly expanded ERR archival guide, which sort of is a continuation of my archival reference background. <laughs> I think we have this up. Um, covering this, this volume, it's published only on the internet, is, covers remaining ERR and related archival documents in 10 countries and uh, 35 repositories, as well as documents helpful in, in trying to trace the ERR loot. In Western, Union, in Western Europe, the ERR was also it's responsible for seizure by the Mobile Action, which emptied an estimated 38,000 homes of Jews who were deported in uh, Paris alone, or either deported or who had fled. My French colleague, Martine Poulain, as a sequel to her book, has been posting on a website thousands of names of individuals and institutions whose books were returned um, for after the war based on French library restitution records that have only just recently been opened. But in contrast, uh, my point is that we need to know who took the book, those books and where they went and why they were turned and where they might be today. And so I've been assisting the French Committee on Jewish Archives uh, present a, a new website with 10 original ERR lists of priority library seizures, uh, which is also sponsored by the Claims Conference uh, ERR project. I found those lists in six different archives in uh, five different countries, the most important being in the British Archives, National Archives in Kew, and surprisingly, the most complete one in the Ukrainian State Archives in Kiev, <laughs> which is how I started with the ERR, because there is the largest batch of ERR records remaining anywhere on the, uh, in the world, and they're now all online. Uh, thanks to the help of the Claims Conference and a project I've been working with. Uh, but the, uh, with the, from these French lists of the three uh, uh, that are being posted now, 300, they cover perhaps only 300 library seizures, but these are the, pri the priority ones. And we even have the codes uh, that the ER used to mark the crates uh, that they ship, with which they ship the books. And it's what's interesting, as a colleague at the Holocaust Museum was pointing out to me with meetings on Monday, these are the same codes that they had for the particular collections of art that were seized from the same prominent French Jewish families. Uh, the, uh, why were they seized? The ER had a firm of ideological purpose 
and I quote from an uh, Rosenberg's own interrogation at Nuremberg in his answer, and I quote, to organize with the help from an Einsatzstab composed of political leaders and experts and from the Wehrmacht of a thorough examination of items left behind by Jews and Freemasons that would provide a basis for future intellectual study necessary for the political, ideological, and academic operations of both the NSDAP and the Hochschule. Rosenberg's protected Hochschule, as he called it, was to become the major post-war university-level training and research facility for the Nazi elite. The central library of the Hochschule was operative in Berlin uh, starting in early 1939. And in 1940, Rosenberg inaugurated the Institute for Research on the Jewish Question, or IEJ as we call it, in Frankfurt, the only Hochschule Institute that was operating during the war and the main destination for Jewish books from Paris. Uh, and then it, the seizure spread to the Netherlands and Belgium and even Greece and the Baltic countries in 1941. Uh, by 1943, IEJ Library could project a total of half a million volumes of Jew from all over Europe. And uh, by the time the end, uh, end of the war, uh, oh, oh, they could we could project over a, ha a million and a half books and journals that they uh, that ended the war in the town of Hungen, 70 miles, uh, 70 kilometers northeast of Frankfurt where the IEJ had their evacuation center. However, they'd been forced to hand over most of their Masonic books uh, to the RSHA <laughs> that were rival on it, uh, because it was Heinrich Himmler's offices that won out for more serious events, investigation of the Freemasonry and the Masonic, quote, enemies of the Reich. Berlin was the second dest major destination for books seized from France and Western Europe. And most of the ERR library operations were there during the first years of the war. But then the books went in two different directions. Those destined for the central library of the Hochschule, or ZBHS, went to Austrian Corinthia, to the monastery of Tanzenberg, and where they ended the war, about 600,000 books for the uh, ZBHS from all over Europe. Uh, a year before the planned invasion of Soviet Union, the ERR also targeted rich East European emigre holdings in Paris, including the Turgenev Library, with which I started, to serve their purpose of the uh, research on the, quote, Bolshevik enemy. And they set up an Ostbucherei, or Eastern Library, uh, as part of their anti-Bolshevik research operations, and it's a very large socialist component from my institute in uh, Amsterdam. They took over the building <laughs> and all of the library, including l the library from, and archives from the Second International in Belgium, all of which are now in Moscow. After Western bombing, uh, not, not, uh, captured books were, moved, were removed from Berlin, out, ordered out of the capital, most of them to Silesia and the Sudetenland, which the, by then the Germans had chopped off from Czechoslovakia. Major ERR research and library operations went with the, Western, from, uh, with the books from Western Europe, went to the isolated or relatively isolated city of Ratabor, uh, it's now Pol in Polish, uh, Ratzibuz, uh, 70 kilometers southwest of Katowice, uh, or in, uh, Polish, Katowice, uh, in Silesia. And thereafter, all the ERR shipments of books from all over Europe were concentrated in Ratibor, including almost two million volumes seized on the Eastern Front that ended the war there. Restitution after the war, uh, many of you may have heard about Offenbach, which was the major uh, concentration of ERR plundered books outside of Frankfurt 
uh, and the one of the collecting points and restitution centers uh, in the U.S. zone of occupation in Germany, where the Offenbach Archival Depot, or OAD, as it's often called, or known as for short, and there were almost uh, one million uh, volumes that the ERR had sent to Frankfurt for the uh, IEJ, and all of the millions from Hungen were brought there. The OEJ, as the antithesis to the ERR, uh, returned almost three million uh, books to countries from which they had been looted. But uh, the second major concentration of ERR books returned to, to France and the or other countries in the West were still in this monastery of Tanzenberg, near Klagenfurt, in the British zone of, of ended up in the British zone of occupation in Austria, and this was where the ERR had amassed about half a million books for their central library of the Hochschule. Uh, the ER, the British captured some of the ERR staff there. Um, and forced them to help sort the books for restitution. And books were even returned to the Soviet Union from Tanzenberg, including 35,000 books from the former Russian imperial palaces outside of Leningrad, including others from Voronezh, Novgorod, and Kiev. Uh, although the, the uh, Soviets never admitted that the Americans or British returned any books or anything else. Uh, to the Soviet Union after the war, and that's a whole other story that I've written about quite extensively. But the, Soviet, the Soviets themselves were not interested in restitution. The estimated two or more million volumes that the ERR had collected from Western and Southeastern Europe that ended the war in Ratibor, Silesia, were not subject to restitution. They became part of the lost memory of the personal and private institutional libraries from which they had come. The roads to Ratibor for books plundered from Western Europe and the Balkans intersected with the roads that brought another mi million or two plundered books from occupied Soviet lands. And that fact that the roads converged in the ERR Silesian center determine their post-war fate. The Soviet Union, as I say, did not participate, except very symbolically, in Western Allied cultural restitution efforts, and certainly not from Ratibor. The Germans, it turned out, had moved most of the books from Ratibor to two warehouses uh, on the railroad line, conveniently, uh, an industrial suburb of Katowice, a red, where, that was where a Red Army trophy brigade found four to 5,000 German crates in two warehouses containing an estimated 1.5 million volumes. And they used that warehouse as a collecting point for additional library materials that they'd found in, the, in Silesia, many from, Bel from Belarus and Baltic libraries. And it was those books, that, in the millions indeed, from Belarus and the Baltic countries were the pretext for a shipment of, to Minsk in ni October of 1945 of 57 freight, car, freight wagons. Uh, but that was only three of, of the one of the three or four trophy shipments of books from Silesia and in addition to many more from Germany itself. Those 57 freight wagons, some people say 54, uh, transported 1.2 million books. Over half of them had, in fact, been looted from Belarus and Baltic libraries, but the other half million were looted from Western and Southeastern Europe. I first reported details about the fall 1945 shipment from Mislovich to Minsk at a library conference in Minsk in 2003, which was rather of a sensation because it had all been suppressed, of course, during the Soviet period. Uh, I had discovered those details quite by chance, as often my discoveries are, uh, in my book on the Turgenev Library from Paris, because the Turgenev Library had also been found there. 
After the conference, with my ERR seizure lists in hand, including the one from Kiev, I was able to identify 90 individual French libraries and 10 institutional libraries with books that had been catalogued in the rare book department of, the Na of what was then the National Library of Belarus. Um, and I think this is, they've since moved to this, this fantastic new building for their National Library uh, just on the verge of Minsk. Those books, including many autographed volumes with illustrious French private libraries, today remain in several different libraries in Minsk. For example, I learned about 5,000 books from the most important pre-1939 private library of Julius Gens from Estonia uh, that's now in the Library of the Academy of Science. I even found a few from former Russian imperial libraries seized from the imperial palaces by the ERR in suburban Leningrad that had not been returned to the Soviet Union or returned to, to, to their home in Leningrad during the Soviet Union. Uh, I learned that 600 books for, uh, in Armenian from the Armenian library in Paris had been transferred to Yerevan because there was no Armenian censor in Minsk to uh, approve them for to be, to be cataloged in the library. Some of the Dutch language books were transferred to the Library of Foreign Literature in Moscow because there was no censor in Minsk who could read Dutch. Uh, about, not, uh, about half of those that were sent to Moscow uh, in 1992 uh, 608 Dutch books were returned to the Foreign Literature Library. This was after the fall of the Soviet Union, the Russian Federation. Uh, they were returned uh, to Amsterdam uh, in, from Dutch, from Moscow. Uh, but many more of the thousands of Dutch books remain in the capital of Belarus. And coincidentally, the return to the Netherlands in 1992 um, was the f included the first book returned to the uh, Turgenev Library in Paris. Uh, namely, Dutch librarians identified the, Dutch, the Turgenev Library stamp in a Dutch language Bible. Uh, which they passed on to the colleagues in Paris. Uh, in, two, uh, in 2011, the Belarus National Library published a CD-ROM, and I'm not sure if it came to, the, to the, if it came to the uh, this meeting. I sh was showing it yesterday to the person who handles Belarus or one of the colleagues in the in the uh, d division. Uh, but this CD-ROM is uh, entitled, in, it's in, the title is in Russian, uh, French Autographs in the Holdings of the National Library of Belarus. The CD, which was published, displays the title pages of 65 books from Paris with autograph de dedications to famous French politicians, writers, and other cultural leaders, with images of those individuals to, uh, whose libraries they found individuals of all these people. Uh, for example, the full text of Le Corbusier's La Vie uh, Radieuse uh, the, the, from Paris, 1933, with a dedication to the Turgenev Library by the author and the uh, book that you saw earlier uh, to, uh, by Chagall uh, to the Turgenev Library. Uh, to be sure, Belarus libraries are very proud to have such a valuable collection of autographed volumes by, Marcel Proust, uh, by such French writers and statesmen, Marcel Proust, Louise Weiss, Georges Clemenceau, Léon Blum, among many others, including uh, numerous members of the Rostro clan. I have a lot of pictures of the title pages that I photographed myself in Minsk in 2003. Unfortunately, um, however, when Russia, when the Soviet Union, or Russia, should I say, after in 1940, um, oh, 
uh, or after the, in 1956, when the Russian Federation joined the European Union, not the European Union, the European Council of, of uh, they signed a declaration with the intent to send home the trophy possessions of other European member states. Of uh, obviously, two years later, they passed the law that I we were subject to a conference at, at Harvard Law School some years ago. Uh, but obviously, those signatures on legal uh, they're not really legal instruments. They would be uh, soft law, as is, as would be called by their lawyers, have not been, brought, uh, helped bring home many of the trophy books and still archives in Russia, let alone Belarus. Other books from the private libraries of Louis uh, of Louise uh, Weiss and Leon Blum and the Rothschild clan were returned to France from OAD in Frankfurt by the U.S. allies or from Tanzenberg by the British. And some of the personal archives of, Louis Weiss, of Louise Weiss and Leon Blum were returned from Moscow to France uh, before by 19 uh, by 2002 and then described and listed in the book Return from Russia that I think was being passed around that uh, I uh, prepared w w with several Dutch colleagues and other European colleagues who'd been involved. But the books with, with dedications to those and other prominent French individuals, some who perished in the Holocaust, remain in Minsk as lost memory for those to whom they were dedicated, and now 70 years later, lost memory for their heirs. One can only wonder, as I do, about the moral justice to treat all such volumes uh, as compensation for the millions of books lost for Belarus state libraries in the course of the war. Uh, let me turn now to the RSH, the right seeker help have have um, <laughs> uh, the security main office in Berlin that were where they concentrated their large collection by 1943. Uh, many of them were also evacuated. One large book, group of Masonic books were evacuated to Himmler's favorite Silesian castle on the Schlesersee, uh, where a Masonic research center continued until January 44. Those now, most of the books that were there are now in a branch, a branch of the University of Poznan Library in one of the Czartoryski castles, former Czartoryski castles, um, and uh, not far from, from Poznan, and a microfiche uh, catalog of that uh, library has been issued. Following a seminar last, uh, sem la, 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 uh, last fall in Amsterdam, a Belgian friend and colleague, Michel Vermont from Ghent, and Mar Ma uh, Martin Poulin from Paris, and I um, are, are organizing first a, a workshop in Minsk this coming September with the help of a Russian Belarus historian who was in Paris last summer that, where I met and participated in this colloquium. And the uh, Wesley Fisher, who unfortunately couldn't be with us today, the research director of the Claims Conference, uh, is providing funding for this uh, seminar. And we've just received formal invitations for Belarus visas. So I think I'll have to come back here and maybe next year and report uh, if we've made any progress in Belarus. But we're not trying to talk about restitution. At the moment, we're more interested in identifying books and more identifying, particularly because it's come to light, there are a lot of Masonic archives that remained in Minsk in some of the cartons of books they hadn't opened. Um, but other books remained from the RSH uh, uh, were evacuated uh, after the war, or during the last years of the war, to four uh, evacuation uh, castles in, in what was then the Sudetenland and uh, also the concentration camp of Terezin, where they evacuated most of the Hebraic uh, literature that they had not been able to catalog. Uh, in Berlin, 
and they uh, forced uh, uh, some of the illustrious Hebraic scholars uh, that, that were interned in Terezin to catalog the Hebraica that they had there. Uh, but the castles of, uh, also in Sudetenland, uh, uh, as I say, this was the Talmud, Talmud, what they called the Talmud Brigade in of uh, Terezin itself, and I. Uh, but there was also a catalog in one of the castles. They were preparing a catalog of uh, occult liter books on occult disciplines. This is in the year 1944, in the height of the of of, of the fighting. Uh, that these these people are working on this occult literature at one of the castles in of uh, Sudetenland, the castle of Mimon, uh, there. And you'll see, next, I think the next slide, I have the, uh, uh, the well, I'll come back to that in a minute. We leave the, uh, the, the map, is fine for now. Uh, some of those, the me, there were a million books that were spread between these four castles and uh, Terezin uh, at the, by the end of the war. And I first announced about, uh, first put together the information I'd collected about these castles. I've actually visited all of them and have pictures in an article that we, I think it may be was passed around, if not, uh, it, it's an article that can be quoted. Um, that, and I pieced together this, and I first published it, the article, first made a presentation about these books, the million books of, uh, in the castles at a conference in Liberets uh, in the, the Czech Republic in 2007. I purposely wanted to do it in the Czech Republic. Um, and they actually published my article in both Czech and uh, in English in the catalog proceedings that I think may be now in another office in the, the, the division here, uh, but it may be of some interest to some, to some of you. Uh, some of those books were, I've, from the research that I was able to do with the help of some Czech colleagues and uh, in German sources, uh, some of the uh, books were returned immediately after the war to Poland, France, Netherlands, and to Germany even. And many hundreds of the Jewish books and Hebraica from Terezin had to be destroyed when they were transported to Prague because of infectious mold uh, that they lacked the f f facilities to control after the war. But the rest of the Jewish books that survived remain today and are very well cataloged by the Jewish Museum in Prague in a database that has been funded by the Jewish Claims Conference um, with careful identification of provenance. And they are now, when they finish this catalog, they are now uh, p are planning to return. And the Czech, there is a Czech law that allows them to return these books to uh, the uh, communities or individuals, in many cases, from which the books came. Uh, some of the books from the castles were distributed to various Czech institutions after the war. Um, and a local example I found uh, was shown, a local museum in Česka Lipa, if you still have the map there, um, acquired uh, about 100 books uh, that had been used uh, for insulation in one of the castles um, because they, they had no other facilities uh, after, the, when, uh, after the war. Uh, but the vast majority uh, that they found uh, and had not returned or restituted after the war went to a massive warehouse uh, in a, a chemical center of Neratovica, which is about 30 minutes drive from Prague. And during the next half century, they became intermixed with books confiscated by the communist regime in Czechoslovakia starting in 1948. 
um, from various museums, uh, monasteries, Masonic lodges, other parts that were that the communist uh, facil- uh, libraries and museums did not le- need unneeded uh, during those years. So the the, the this warehouse came to close, and I hadn't known all the details about this until really just last year. Uh, starting in 2015, the Czech National Library undertook a project to catalog these books, and they received uh, EU funding, most, and it turned out to be mostly Norwegian funding. Norway is not a member of the EU, but it makes a contribution every year, which is usually used for some cultural project. And the Norwegian contribution last year was being used uh, to catalog these books at the National Library in, uh, in Prague that had been relegated for, to the warehouse for, um, uh, seven, for 70 years. The, lead, the director of this project contacted me because he... Um, had seen my article that was written, that was published in both Czech and uh, English, and I actually had been in contact with the deputy director of the library, who uh, of the National Library, who uh, confided to me at one meeting about ten years ago that he had been in his first job when he came to the library uh, was helping move the books from the castles in Sudetenland to this warehouse in Neretovice. But he didn't know what they were or where they'd come from or anything about them. Uh, Since then, I think we can have the next uh, uh, picture, if you have. Uh, The director, well, I'm afraid that may not be very readable, but it's just a little sample of what I (laughs) would like to show about this project. Uh, last October, this director, I hadn't met the director of the, of the project at the Czech Library, but he had been in touch with me because they were then saying they only had 300,000 books in this warehouse. But he finally agreed to take me out there when I was going to be in Prague last, last October for an international conference that was sponsored by another group in, uh, in the Czech capital. And he even set up a very formal uh, workshop uh, where he, they were going to tell me about this project and tell me where the books it came from. Well, when they gave me a few minutes to speak, I showed them uh, pictures of uh, this catalog, that uh, some fragments of the catalog that I had found in the Bundesarchiv in Berlin uh, of a 400-page the, the whole fragments ca- counted to be about 400 pages of this catalog of occult literature that was being of, uh, prepared in one of the, the castle of Mimon. Um, I, just before coming to Prague, I had given a lecture in Berlin at the Central and Regional Library there over the last few years, that library has developed a marvelous uh, database for what they call Raub, Raubgut of, of for looted books that they have found, probably eight to 10,000, that they found in their library that had been left in Berlin, many of them by the Gestapo or part, other parts of the RSS. And they have been returning them to the, uh, trying to identify and return them to their owners. Well, I, when I was talking to the, these librarians whom I had met actually before about the project in Prague, I said, well, let me try to get you, if you could come a couple of days early for the conference, let me try to get you invited also to this workshop that they've set up for me at the National Library in Prague. And I wrote the project director immediately, and he finally agreed. But when we got there, he refused to take the Germans with me to the C. Narotovice, to this warehouse. Uh, but he said, first, he said that security provisions were such that hadn't been arranged far enough in advance, and that they didn't have a car big enough. But when we went to get in, when we went to get in. Uh, the car, 
uh, that was going to take me there. There was a minivan right beside it that didn't look like it was going anywhere. <laughs> but uh, this is... Uh, I also took with me, was able to arrange to take at this workshop, uh, a Masonic archivist and librarian whom I've known now for probably about 10 years. Uh, and I had helped him uh, in Moscow where he, over the past few years, has identified uh, four to 5,000 Masonic, looted Masonic archival files from Norway, Norwegian Masonic uh, lodges that are still in, that were still with the collection in Moscow in the special archive because no one had sorted them out and they couldn't write. He's been going back and forth and identified these. Uh, these Norwegian files, and finally, they now have a, f a formal claim in, uh, in to the uh, Russian government for these files. But anyway, he was going to be at this conference in Prague, and he's been looking for uh, Norwegian and other Masonic, he's just a specialist throughout the Masonic world. And I asked him to come also. And particularly then, I told him, well, you know, that the, the funding for this project is from Norway. And so he very quickly looked in to, fi to find out what was going on, <laughs> because he hadn't known about the Norwegian sponsorship for this identification project in, in Prague. But in any case... Matt, just one second, just uh, five more minutes. Okay, yeah, I'm just down to the end. Um, I, thank you for <laughs> checking. I've been ad libbing a little too much in here, uh, but in any case, I when I when I at this workshop, I showed them more of these cattle because I had a lot of the fragments. And he was saying, "Well, why didn't you get get a, get bring us? Can't you give us copies?" I said, "I'm sorry, the Bundes Archiv charges a lot of money to 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 copy 400 pages, and uh, besides, they wouldn't allow me." to give them to you, a national institution, you have to ask them yourself. In any case, the National Library finished this project, and you can go on to the, you, know, you have it here. Um, it finished this project uh, that they were doing. I incidentally got into a large argument when we were on the drive out to Naratovica with this project director who told me he does not believe in restitution. Um, but uh, the Norwegian colleague, they did bring us, they did let us visit the, re the processing center at their cataloging depot out, just outside of Prague, where they had brought 7,000 books that were identified as belonging to, to fr uh, fr individual Freemasons and anti-Masonic individuals, lodges, or Masonic libraries from uh, most of them are German, but some were from French, be the Benelux countries, Austrian, Austria, Hungary, and Czech Masonic books. Uh, the Czech project director then was already announcing no rep repatriation will take place. But when the results of his trial project were presented in Prague, a, a month ago, my Norwegian colleague went to this pre presentation, um, and he uh, uh, was reported back, and they have now posted this website on the National Library website from uh, in Prague about the project, but it's a little not quite the story that I was telling about the project, and it says nothing about the foreign books that from that were being cataloged in the castles in the Sudetenland, and doesn't it mentions my name, but not my article that I wrote about them. The day after our meetings at the National Library, I took my German, I was able also to arrange for my German and Norwegian friends, to, we visited the Jewish Museum in Prague, where the librarian showed us a marvelous ongoing project to identify former owners of the Jewish books of, that had come from these castles in Terezin. But to conclude, 
uh, this morning, <laughs> just before, just before I came into the, the the room here for the talk, I received another another email from my Norwegian uh, Masonic archivist friend, and he had just found for me a picture of the castle of Mimon. Uh, that I didn't, I have. I went to try to see it myself, but it was destroyed in 1984 and by the Czechs uh, because they said it was going to burn down. I don't know what the problems were. But anyway, he sent me some uh, photograph that was taken just before the destruction um, and also uh, photographs of some of the foreign books that we had been shown at this Czech library uh, center in Hostovar with ex libris and bookmarkings that he was helping them, that he had identified just, we only had about 40 books there from Masonic lodges, and he could tell almost immediately which lodge these were from. And uh, earlier he had, told, uh, he had told me that they had a presentation in Norway about the project about a month ago, and the Norwegians have now refused for further funding to continue the project uh, with the current project director. Uh, and in his message this morning, uh, Helga Horisland wrote me, to conclude, the project has ended without any real conclusion. None of the chosen 13,000 books have been ca that they have already catalog have been cataloged properly. And until that has been done for the whole consignment, there's really not much of a conclusion that can be made. So I conclude with that sad uh, note from Norway, and I will just could remark that I guess I'll have to come back again in another year to report about our seminar in Minsk next September and possibly another visit to Prague uh, to see uh, if they've made any progress. But then at least I don't need to get a visa for the Czech Republic. Uh, and I do have some other friends there uh, that will be glad to see me, even if the library may not be. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I have a question about the last point that you made, where you said that your Norwegian friend had sent you the uh, the message about the the project being stopped because the, uh, uh, the the books that were to have been cataloged were not being cataloged properly. Uh, what was the expectation? What, what, how, how do they expect the? Do you, if you know, how, how do they expect the books to be uh, to be cataloged? And in what manner were they not being cataloged properly? Um, I don't want to get too technical with this, and I myself am not a technical library cataloger, but uh, if you compare the systems, the, the data, database systems that they were using in the National Library with the system they were using in the Jewish uh, Museum in Prague, you'll see the, the difference. The, they were trying to register these books. They had no facility to show the bookmarkings and the ex libris that were in the books in the, in the catalog. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the Jewish Museum, they've developed that facility. They had no fields that they were filling in for uh, the fact that books had the markings and what markings those might have been. It was, an, it was a project to try to get just to get the name and title the way a poly very preliminary cataloging basis. They have the facilities at the National Library because I know that they <coughs> cataloged and have on their website the, uh, uh, the early uh, Hebrew uh, manuscripts from the uh, Breslau Rabbinical Seminary that were found there 10 years ago. They have the facilities to catalog them properly. But this man, the, his head of, I, as I say, I, I had a bit of an in with him, or an out with him, but he did send me uh, the website that I could, the, the URL, so I could see his website, and which is in English. And if you see that, you will see the way they are presenting this project. They are mainly interested in the Bohemica that's there, the books from the, the from Bohemia, 
uh, and but the foreign ones they're trying to forget. And the Nor my Norwegian friend even said, uh, t wrote me at one point, and uh, this I have not confirmed, and so but it's apparent because if you'll see one of the things on the, one of the uh, the at the top of the website. Uh, it, I think there's a thing for the legal, uh, oh no, it's not late, late, later, if you go down another step. There's a le also a legal document that has been translated into English. And apparently what he said, that the library has used some of the project funding, which is why they're not being cataloged properly, uh, for a legal opinion, for, for a legal study to see how the, uh, the legal basis that the National Library can nationalize these books. Mm. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, well, well, Pat gave us a lot of information there. <laughs> Many of them over, 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 but um, I can just say that I hope I can come back, come back maybe another uh, another time, and I can tell you a little bit more about how things are going. And right, because uh, what's what's a shame? These these are books, the books that are being found. That there are not many, maybe not many of them that still remain for the occult sciences, <laughs> for yoga and uh, astrology and uh, what what whatever. That are that are being found, but it's very curious when I saw lists in Paris of the books that had been returned to France in 1948 from Prague, uh, and they the French had lists in their restitution records of books returned. There were a lot, uh, many of them were uh, from occult science, the ones that the SD had apparently taken from <laughs> French collections. Uh, that were that 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 were about occult sciences, and, and, and th this also is, a, and there was a, a project in one of the other councils. I think I really need to republish this article that I did for the Czech conference uh, with an update now, and I am hoping to turn some of my findings into a book about the lost libraries that will have some of these details uh, that have not simply not been known. But I also think that the issue at the National Library um, of the Czech Republic, and I think my, the Norwegian colleagues are going to start this, I think it's something that should be brought to the attention of IFLA. Uh, it's one thing in Minsk, because B Belarus is not a member of, maybe they are a member, they probably are a member of IFLA, but that's the International Federation of Library Associations, the International Li Library Association. And there have been a very strong movement in IFLA about identifying uh, books that, that, that are uh, displaced <laughs> uh, in foreign libraries, particularly the valuable ones and this autographs. And so I think that, there, there may, that, that it should be brought to the attention. And I hope some of the people here at the national, uh, our nas national library, the Library of Congress, uh, will all uh, may also want to take notice uh, about the the uh, about the, these types of problems because it's, we're talking about major collections, uh, particularly a more major collection in Minsk than is the case in in Prague. I'm afraid that a lot of the people aren't going to go after the witchcraft books. I even had a, a, a email last week from a woman who runs a, a witchcraft newsletter. <laughs> uh, because she'd heard there were 7,000 books they found on witchcraft in one of these things. And I assured her, I say, I think that this is a, a blow up that someone wants to criticize the project from other directions uh, to say that they're... <laughs> But anyway, that's I was just going to say that those of us who are bibliophiles, and I'm most most of us in this room, I think, are, you know, value our book as a book, uh, the binding, the smell, the the print, and so forth. But it seems to me, in an age when when uh, we're going towards uh, digitization, uh, 
the most important thing, it may not be the book itself, many of which are 70 or more years old and are probably deteriorating, but it may be the information in them. And I was going to ask Pat, how much of this, you know, all these books are in the Mensa Library. Is the information in these books somehow available, uh, maybe in a digital form, or do you have to go to Prague and go to the library and actually look at the book? Well, uh, thank you for raising that question, Jim. Uh, and this is very important. Uh, a, Bel a Belarus colleague that I, f whom I first met in 2003 when I was in Minsk, uh, he's now, I think, close to 90. Uh, he had been the Belarus uh, uh, SSR, <laughs> the Soviet Republic of Belarus, uh, UNESCO representative in Paris in, I think he said, the six, late 50s or 60s. And he just said, told me, he said, you know, it was very sad for me when I met the widow of Leon Blum or the uh, or Louise Weiss, who was a leading feminist uh, journalist in France, that I couldn't return or to even tell them that their books were in Minsk. Mm -hmm. He has written some lovely articles. Most of them are in Russian or Belarus. There are a couple in English that I cite in my article uh, about some of the relation to the inform the archival information personal archival information that's in those books. Because these are, these are books with very famous French autographs of, uh, of, of leading statesmen. And, uh, um, and he's done a beautiful job of showing uh, the dedications, many, to, to, in some cases, to people who perished in, in uh, Buchenwald or Auschwitz. And he's done the research on the, he's, he was a rector of the School of, of uh, Linguistics in Prague, a specialist on French language and literature, and he's particularly researched these books. And uh, I, last, last summer in Paris, I met one, and I think that this uh, the young historian, the Belarus historian, who now is helping arrange our seminar in Minsk, was a student of his because he spoke very good French, um, and I think it was his first trip outside of Belarus. But he uh, was on a, a, a stipend that a Paris friend of mine had arranged, and he gave a lecture at the Institut de France uh, about the anti-Dreyfus uh, documents and manuscripts of several of the leaders, the Jewish leaders that were uh, 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 about the Dreyfus affair, because these were books the Nazis obviously were, had been trying to capture from Joseph Renach and his family in Paris. Um, and so this is the kind of information that is there, and these were manuscripts uh, from Joseph Renach that were, had never been cataloged before in Minsk, and because no one wanted them, or they were all suppressed during the Soviet period, um, and he's writing a doctoral dissertation about the Masonic manuscripts that are there, and it turns out that they are fragments of the same Masonic of the, of the same Masonic archives that were returned from Moscow to Paris uh, by the year 2000, because uh, archives that were found in Minsk all had to be sent to Moscow after the war, but not all the books. And so they uh, were all collected in this central repository for special, the special archive that I described in this book, Return from Russia. But, and so these are the types of materials, but he, he's written some lovely, uh, I just heard that he is still able to come and that he's agreed to come to our seminar next September in, in Minsk. Uh, we're just keeping it very small, uh, the mission that we're trying to, to and I hope, I hope to meet him again, but he has a card file of some of the books that he found particularly important from the, for their dedications, for the interpersonal relations that they show in these dedications of the books let alone the books themselves. I mean, some of these are from 
a bibliophile collections of the Rothschilds from the 18th century. Uh, I mean, uh, the, the, the rare book department that I had the catalog, you know, only books from the from rare books. And what are these books needed in uh, Minsk? There's no one. I think this young man that we met in, in Paris last summer is probably the first to you even identify some of the manuscripts, a collection of Masonic, of uh, Napoleonic manuscripts and things in the Napo Napoleonic period that, that are with these materials. Yeah. So, sorry. I'm going to stomp you here. I'm the cruel time manager. Yes, okay. <laughs> um, I have to step in. So thank you all for coming. Please help me. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.